I'd like to talk now about a few odds and ends that I think uh, may be of interest to anyone attempting to maintain these engines. If, um, if you worked around these radials very much, you know that, uh, um, that chasing down an oil leak can really be uh, a challenge sometimes. One tablespoon of hot oil can wind up all over the airplane. And uh, because of the, uh, the prop blast and the way that the wind is whipping around, oil that starts off over here winds up over here. And so it's, it's really tough to figure out sometimes uh, where the oil is coming from. And so uh, what we do around here when we're, we're trying to determine the source of an oil leak is to begin by washing the engine down. Get it, get it nice and clean so that uh, you know, there's, uh, there's not a lot of confusion from what's happened before. Blow it dry and wash it twice if necessary. And then we take a roll of paper towels and, um, and we make little diapers. And uh, we just kind of fold this up so that it is appropriate to the, uh, to the oil leak. Let's, let's just assume that we've got an oil leak somewhere around this number three cylinder. We're not sure exactly where. It could be a push rod tube seal, could be a rocker cover, uh, could be the, uh, the hoses, the fittings, uh, it could be the, the rocker shaft. So what we do is we make little diapers and, um, and get a roll of, uh, of tape. And we're, we're going to tape the places that we suspect. So we'll, we'll, we'll just make a little diaper for this push rod tube seal here. And, uh, and we'll tape it on. And we'll tape it down real good so that the prop blast is not going to blow it off. And uh, like that. Now, if we diaper up everything that we suspect, and then we fire the engine up and run it for a little bit, warm it up real good and run it, and we still have oil all over the place, we know we didn't find it because our diaper will catch any oil that happens to be coming from the area that, uh, that is protected there. And if that is the place, then all we need to do is take a razor blade and carefully slit our diaper, open it up, and you'll see a fine line of oil right around the, uh, the parting surface there. So the engine looks a little funny when you get it all diapered up, but uh, it's probably the quickest way that I know of to determine where oil leaks are located. We're often asked about our preference for gasket cements, so this will give me an opportunity to plug uh, Yamaha Motorcycle Company. What we like to use around here is Yamabon 4. Yamabon 4 is advertised as a semi-drying liquid gasket. They put Yamaha motorcycle engines together without gaskets, just with this stuff. Uh, we like it real well. It, uh, it holds well, uh, does well with oil and with gasoline, and, uh, and doesn't set up like a rock. We're sometimes asked about the difference between the so-called good style cylinders and bad style cylinders. One of the, uh, the primary ways to differentiate between these cylinders is by looking at the head to barrel joint where the aluminum head meets the steel barrel. On the good style cylinder, there is a space between the last fin, the last steel fin, and the aluminum head. On the bad style, there is a double width steel fin here between the, uh, the head and the barrel. And the general consensus is that this double width steel fin against the aluminum over time pushes as the heat, as the cylinder heats and contracts, pushes against the head and loosens this head to barrel joint, uh, eventually causing a separation between the two and, and leakage. Whereas when, uh, when Jacobs improved it and left this space, uh, there's, uh, there's no tendency for it to push away. Anyone who's operated a Jacobs engine for very long knows that a few years ago a real challenge was the coils and condensers for the uh, battery ignition uh, side of the, uh, of the ignition system. Uh, thanks to John Collette at Butterfly Aviation, we now have a replacement coil, which is a modern uh, automotive style new production coil and, uh, and condenser that are fully STC'd uh, for the Jacobs engine. Uh, this works so much better than the, uh, than the old Bendix stuff. Old Bendix stuff, I'm sure, was great in its day, but coils and condensers were not designed to sit on the shelf for 60 years uh, without being used. And so, uh, so this is a problem that, that has really been alleviated. We no longer have the difficulties that we had just a few years ago with the battery ignition.
another thing that all of us have had to struggle with uh, the last few years has been radio interference. Um, radios have gotten much, much more sensitive than they used to be uh, to the extent that the shielding that these engines were designed with is marginal for some radios. Uh, the C26S spark plug, which was originally uh, certified for this engine, will no longer work with modern radios. Even though it's a shielded plug, it still emits way too much radio frequency uh, to be able to be used with it. But um, another uh, issue is that of grounding. This is the, uh, the distributor cap. This is the cover that, uh, that covers it. And, uh, and this is the elbow that goes from the distributor shield uh, forward to the, um, the large conduit that runs forward to the, um, the loom. And um, what we've learned is that every piece of this shielding needs to be a good electrical bond with every other piece. So the threads you know, have to be a, a tight engagement. You can't have loose threads or it's not a good electrical connection. And one of the worst offenders in this area is, uh, is right here with this shield and the way the elbow comes in. As you can see, it's very loose. And as a result, it's not a good electrical connection. It sits there and vibrates, and as it vibrates, it emits RF and uh, uh, all kinds of interference. So everything has to be tight with everything else. Uh, you can put little shims in here to tighten all this up. Uh, be sure and use aluminum so that uh, we don't have a dissimilar metal problem and also it makes a good electrical bond. Paint. If you, uh, if you wind up with paint on, uh, on any of these surfaces, paint is an excellent insulator and uh, won't allow them to bond to one another. So, so be sure that everything is clean where it touches everything else, where radio shielding is concerned with the magneto and the distributor. And that will, uh, that will really resolve that problem. Now what if there is another issue? What if there's a, a problem with a coil that, uh, that is failing, still working, but it's making noise? Or with a, a spark plug lead that's possibly broken inside, we can't see it, but the, um, the lead itself is broken and emitting uh, radio frequency. Well, what we do is we get a garden variety roll of uh, aluminum foil, and we tear off some little pieces, and we make our own shielding. So let's, let's assume that maybe the, the uh, magneto side is nice and quiet, but um, when you switch to the distributor, there's lots and lots of noise. Well, let's start shielding things. Let's shield everything on the front side of the ignition system. And, um, and we have to be sure that we're making a good electrical connection here. So, so they, you know, it, it can't be touching painted things. It has to be touching uh, and grounding in, a, in an effective manner. But let's shield it. And, uh, and it may not kill all the radio noise, but if it changes it, then we know we're in the right uh, vicinity. And we have to do things one at a time. So we'll do this lead, if not, and we'll run it. If nothing changes, we'll switch to this lead and see if something changes. And we'll be listening each time with the radio to see if we've changed the, the radio frequency interference that we're hearing. And once we've, uh, once we've changed it, then we know the component that we can go after.